Um, so thank you all for um, coming here and um, attending the panel on inclusivity. Um, this has been uh, an ongoing focus um, within the Linguistic Society of America for the last year um, and, and longer. And we're really um, looking forward to opening up dialogue among um, LSA members on this very important topic. Um, today, we have uh, Savi Namburipad, Karina Okino, and Lynn Ho, who will be presenting the results of a survey of linguists and language researchers focusing on topics such as harassment and bias. Um, the format will be uh, for the first 30 minutes. Um, these three linguists will be presenting some results from their survey, um, going over the data and talking about um, the implications and um, what we can learn from this. Um, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions, and that will come in three modalities. You can ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag linguist survey, L-I-N-G-U-I-S. T-S-U-R-V-E-Y. Um, and then the second modality is uh, via microphone. There is only one mic over here. And uh, please do not stand up in your seat. Well, don't stand on the seat. But don't stand in your seat and say, don't worry, I can project. I was a music theater major. No, don't. You cannot project. And uh, the people who are in the front here interpreting need you to be clear. So walk over to the microphone located there and ask your question. And then the third way to ask a question is um, just in case you don't feel comfortable um, asking in person or you um, are averse to Twitter, you can write your question down on a card. These will be magically distributed somehow during the course. They're happening now. See? Magic. It happens. Um, so you can write your question down on a card, and these cards will be collected at some point. Um, you can ask, you write your question as it comes up. They'll be collected, and then there'll be some organic way to figure out how questions are um, asked and answered. I don't have to worry about that. The speakers will figure it out somehow, okay? Um, so without any further ado, um, let me introduce the presenters for today. Um, we also have Robin Queen and Penny Eckert here in the front who will be here to assist and be present to make sure that this is a su successful event. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Well, I should say the other reason that it's important that Robin or Penny are here is because we're going to be talking about solutions to problems, and um, the three of us are not really folks that know a lot about what's going on in the LSA Executive Committee, but those guys are. So if you have questions about um, things or sort of suggestions that pertain to the LSA or things that more senior scholars can do, then that would also be like an appropriate venue to talk about that. So that's another um, another thing that I wanted to mention. Anyway, okay, so I want to thank you all so much for being here. Um, and before I begin, I want to acknowledge, um, so uh, 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 Kareen, Lena, and I are going to be presenting, but we have a big team um, who made this possible. So Haley, Marjorie, Mar Marjorie Dominique, Dom, and Anne, um, many of whom are here. I want to just acknowledge all the hard work that they put into this um, uh, research as well. So today we're just going to give a short talk about some of our data, about 30 minutes, and we're going to use this as a preamble for a conversation, like we just said, about what we can do to make our academic community safer and better. We want to encourage wide participation in this ongoing discussion. Okay, so I'm doing this because it's on the presenter notes, but we already explained it. Um, so if you're on Twitter, use hashtag linguist survey um, and uh, note cards, pencils, etc. All right. So what are our goals? Our goals are to connect and contextualize the individual experiences of harassment and bias that a lot of us have experienced. If you've experienced this, you are not alone, and we are with you. We wanted to solicit impressions of climate in the field and suggestions from the community, provide empirical support for those working to make a change via our survey data, and move from conversation to action. We know that the people in this room, a lot of people in this room, have been doing this hard work for a really long time, and we hope that our contribution can help galvanize others to join in and be another citation to convince maybe other people to fund this type of work. So 
We're here in part because 2017 was a banner year for linguistics and overlapping fields. When it came to allegations of serious, serial sexual harassment becoming public, and this is accompanied by a lot of formal and informal discussions and a lot of hand wringing. But as many of us knew at the time, the problem is so much wider than that. And that's why we did this survey. I'd like to sh- start by sharing three quotes from this survey. I'll explain more about the survey later. Um, that illustrate the types of experiences people are having as they are members of our community. One of my advisors is fond of sexist and racist jokes. And I'm afraid, what? Oh, oh, right. I forgot that I had to click twice. There's a presenter view thing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, so those were our goals that I did not, uh, now you can read them. Thanks. Can you advance to the next one? Actually, I can, I can, I can I'll remember now. So one of my advisors is fond of sexist and racist jokes, and I'm afraid to confront him about it because I suspect he already takes me less seriously because I am a woman. I hear about the guys who are lauded in public and then prey on women behind the scenes and drive them off. I've been intentionally excluded from academic opportunities by a former advisor who strongly favored his female students and maintained unprofessional relationships with them. So we're talking about harassment and bias today because these experiences are so common that they could apply to multiple people. These quotes are actually very middle of the road when it comes to our survey responses. And we have many, many, many more examples. We have a website that has a bunch of different examples um, of people's um, testimonials about harassment based on gender, race and ethnicity, perceived English proficiency, disability, and so on. As many of us know and have experienced this bad behavior, which was made public, is just the tip of the iceberg. And not only is it not isolated to particular individuals, there are also many more people ostensibly well-meaning who have and are enabling this type of behavior to continue. So today we're addressing the people who witness and hear about these behaviors and want to take action to improve our academic communities. Okay, so let's talk about the survey. So the survey was designed to ask how our identities have shaped our professional experiences and how we can improve the climate in our fields. So here are some quick methods. Um, there are more details online. So we just did a survey via professional listservs and social media. I think it was talked about at the civility panel last year at the LSA. There was a mix of multiple choice and open-ended questions for about 1,400 total responses. The response was from all over the world, and it was anonymous. And so the roadmap is I'm going to talk about goals and major findings, and I'm going to talk about who experiences harassment and bias. Kareen's going to talk about the effects of harassment and bias, and Lena will start us on our discussion of solutions and next steps. We're only presenting a small slice of the results. There's more on the website, and there's even more forthcoming. So when we read, when we asked people about climate and linguistics, we were interested in, like, all of these different topics, and a lot of you told us about these different topics. So things that we know that are relevant are things like representation of underrepresented groups at different levels, theory-based and disciplinary conflicts, neocolonialism and the hegemony of the global north, and funding and job availability, which uh, two of our collaborators presented about earlier today. So all of these things were identified as contributing to negative climate and linguistics. Um, And we're focusing on harassment today. Uh, All of these things matter, basically, is what we're trying to say. All of these things matter, but um, and if you have questions about them and if you're interested in them, there's more to come. But we're choosing to make this moment about this because we really want to highlight the overt and casual bigotry that many of us experience as we're just trying to learn and teach and do our jobs. All right. So I'm going to show you a graph. And um, we asked this question, how, how often have you been the target of bias incidents? So the y-axis will have the percentage of responses. And on the x-axis, you'll see like never, rarely, sometimes, etc. And so... As you see, so I'll give you a sec to look at it. As you see, the most common response was rarely, and the overall distribution skews towards people being the target of bias incidents. And by the way, um, we defined what bias incidents was in the survey. We gave examples, things like that. Um, 
So however, let's break down these bars a bit. So I'm going to show you the same graph, but I'm going to split up the bars based on participant self-reported race and ethnicity. So the way that we did this was, um, so we had a lot of responses, um, different options for people, but um, we categorized everyone who self-identified as white as white, and we categorized everyone else as POCs. We have a more fine-grained data, but this is just easier for simplicity. And because there's so few people of color that responded that we didn't want to risk violating anonymity, their ends get kind of small. Um, which is not really surprising given the demographics of our field. All right, so there's the white folks first. So like I said, like, um, if you look at the folks who responded never, um, you know, almost uh, 75 or over <laughs> over 80% of the people who um, were uh, represented in that bar um, were white. All right, so um, we see that, uh, here we go. And I'm gonna, there's the people of color. So this kind of makes sense because they're, graphs that go like this, but we see that the percentage of people of color increases um, uh, over um, like incidents of, or like rate of uh, experience of harassment. Um, and so note again that the ends are kind of small, but that's the whole point so I have the total ends here. And so I have to note that this is not taking into account people of color who grew up as and are currently in the majority um, in their countries because it's an international survey. And we also don't look at black and indigenous people of color separately here. Um, and we know that um, Black and Indigenous people face different types of um, uh, oppression than other types of people of color. So if we account for that, I suspect we would see even more stark difference between these two groups. And what we know from other research is that social identities affect who experiences harassment. So there was a study that we were sort of inspired by in astronomy, and they found that women of color face greater risks of gendered and racial harassment. And so we wanted to see if we could find that in our field as well. So I'm going to show you gender, race, and then race plus gender. All right, so similar graphs to before. Um, I'm going to start with just men, so cis male. So, um, uh, and then I'll show you cis females, and then we analyze the responses of everyone who responded as something other than the first two together. Um, I know that that's not the ideal term for that, but I'm sorry about that. So we have um, cis males here, cis female, and other. And so you can see there's a really big difference between these two groups. And since it's hard to process the distributions, a good way to look at the differences between the graphs is to notice the percentage of responses to never. There are clear differences here between men and the other two groups in this regard. So let's, I highlight, oh, whoops, sorry. There we go. I highlighted that for you. Okay, so you see that. All right. It's doing two things with two hands. All right. Um, and now here's um, everyone together. I'll let you take a look, and then I'm going to highlight the numbers again. All right. So what we see here is that who we are has a strong and clear effect on our professional experiences. Our experiences are not uniform, and we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Okay, so now that we have this data that shows the responses of who is particularly susceptible to this kind of harassment, um, we want to show you how minoritized individuals and groups who experience these kinds of targets or are targets of this kind of bias, um, what kind of implications does this have? Or what, what happens when you experience this kind of bias? What are the repercussions? So um, again, we're going to start out with a quote about um, discrimination against non-native English speakers. This was actually our second most reported reason for why people feel discriminated against, which is pretty shameful since we're linguists. <laughs> um, this person says, non-native speakers can feel isolated even when the others are not intentionally isolating them. That makes many of us stop attending to social gatherings or rather informal meetings. Personally, I feel reluctant to go out to the meetings that I do not have to go to when I know none of the other participants are non-native speakers or other visible minorities because I had so many unpleasant episodes. So what we found is that many participants reported avoiding professional or professional adjacent spaces, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, like these informal meetings, um, because of this kind of derogatory behavior that they've witnessed or experienced. Um, 
One common theme that emerged was that non-native speakers, especially those who don't identify as white or European, felt especially discriminated against and violated. Um, so they are among the people who are most likely to avoid spaces. So, um, yeah. So um, basically, the avoidance of professional and professional adjacent spaces is a really important kind of side effect of what happens when people are exposed to these kinds of bias incidents. And that in itself, that avoidance of spaces actually leads to a loss of access, inclusion, and other missed opportunities that have really detrimental effects on the professional progression in the field. So what do we mean by spaces? I've used this term for two slides now, but I haven't defined my term. So let's unpack that a little bit. Here um, we have a demographic of <laughs> here we have a demographic um, or a representation of the different types of spaces. So spaces really the definition that we're using is any physical environment that bodies occupy throughout their day. And these spaces differ in terms of who controls them. So that's what this graphic is showing here. Um, at the bottom of the graph in pink, you can see um, we have something that's labeled professional adjacent. This can also be thought of more personal spaces. Um, these are spaces that aren't necessarily under control of departments or the college or the field. These are things like the grad commons or hallways, you know, in the building that you occupy. This can also be off-campus hangouts such as bars or other places that um, faculty or students might, you know, congregate for going out for drinks or something after a talk. Um, the next level up, you can see departmental spaces. These are things like labs and classrooms or departmental functions, things that departments have direct control over. So these spaces are things organized by departments themselves. Um, the next level up is university or college level spaces. So these are things like um, campus-wide colloquia, um, the campus itself, where we feel we can go in the spaces on our own campuses and where we feel welcome. Um, this can also be things like administrative offices. I know a lot of faculty and students have to negotiate, um, you know, working with admin at all different levels. So this is another type of space that's not necessarily under departmental control, but it's at the university level. And then after that, we have professional spaces. And these are things like conferences like the LSA or job interviews um, or maybe working on field sites. Again, these are things that are not directly controlled by departments or by universities, but these are things that we all as professionals have control over. So what's really important to think about is where you fit in terms of what control you have over in each of these different kinds of spaces that we all occupy on a daily basis. So one question we asked on the survey about spaces was this. Um, have you avoided any of the following spaces due to climate concerns? And they had 16 choices. Um, they could answer as many as they wanted. They could click multiple things or they could add in other, you know, that they specified themselves. And um, we had a total of 1,995 uh, responses. And the most common response of a space that people avoid was social events in their own department, which, again, I think is something that is we really need to take seriously that something that we have direct control over, a space that we have control over, is a place where people feel the least welcome. Um, the next two most common responses were starting collaborations and informal meetings. So again, these are professional um, or departmental spaces that we, as members of the LSA, have control over. We can do something about these spaces. Um, so... Other spaces that people reported here, these are actually just representative of the top 60%, um, which are the seven most common responses. But you can see things like um, conferences or workshops that are avoided, academic events in your department, um, workshop dinners at conferences, or uh, joining labs or research groups. So these are all probably spaces that we've all occupied at some time in our lives. And thinking about whether or not people feel safe or included in those spaces is really important. So here's another quick testimonial about um, basically avoiding collaborations due to harassment. And this person reports unwanted sexual advances from senior men, including my Ph.D. advisor, supervisor, a hostile environment which caused me to miss out on potentially career advancing collaborations in order to avoid potential harassment. So these are the things that are happening in our departments. 
Um, and what this testimonial really illustrates is that this avoidance of collaboration due to even potential harassment, because people have witnessed this harassment happening to other individuals, um, is actually even enough. That reputation in itself is enough for people to avoid spaces, especially for graduate students or people that don't have as much power in departments. And um, when people pick up on these kind of networks of whispers about people, what we know is that um, they feel vulnerable and they feel that they need to avoid these spaces in, or in order to protect themselves from harassment. So um, just to quick summarize, the point of that is that um, to avoid harassment and other unpleasant Avoiding professional adjacent spaces is a survival strategy that people use to avoid experiences, experiencing continued harassment or to avoid being triggered by things that they've potentially experienced before based on harassment. And that this strategy that people are using as a coping mechanism basically to survive is really detrimental to their ability to network and contribute to the field. So you might be wondering to yourself, well, what percentage of people who responded to your survey actually think this is a problem? Maybe you think, like, I think it's a problem, or maybe you think, I don't think it's a problem. But um, basically 70% of the people that responded to this question in our surveys felt that there needs to be a change in the climate. They've noticed something, and they want to do something about it. Um, notably, though, 17% of people said they don't think there's a problem. They think it's all good. So... Um, I think what we want to really focus on is that while there is a small percentage that doesn't feel that there's a problem with the climate, that, um, you know, the majority really acknowledge that this is something that we need to work on together as a community, and people offered a lot of really creative solutions. So now Lena's going to talk about what those solutions might be. I don't... I don't have four hands, so I'm going to ask someone to click for me. Thank you. You'll click the slides. I'll, I'm looking at this one. Okay. My turn. As my colleagues have said, we have a problem in the climate, particularly in academia. So we'd like to provide some evidence-based solutions to implement some action. We know that from recent incidents in sexual harassment and looking at the media and our survey, we have some things that don't work. We have a lot of bureaucracy from those who report, meaning that those who file official reports get caught up in the bureaucracy. It takes a lot of time and investment of energy and resources. And it isn't only true for the person who has been affected, but for all involved. So for that reason, often people avoid reporting. Secondly, tech, uh, Title IX training that is, for example, mandatory online, it provides textbook scenarios for sexual harassment, and it talks about a bias in the workplace and um, that these are not from ignorance or even those conscious actions, but implicit biases rooted in our culture. And overt education of this type of training does not allow us to address the implicit bias. We can address it on certain levels, but not necessarily directly. Thirdly, more diversity doesn't necessarily fix the problem. We have a lot of underrepresented people who have been hired and expands our diverse group, but it doesn't necessarily solve the issue. Simply because it doesn't change the culture. It doesn't provide a space for those people to be hired and work. And we also know that the research has shown the number of women in STEM has increased However, at the same time, the rate of harassment and bias to those women has not decreased in parallel. I'd like to show you an excerpt from a quote with a follow-up interview that we did with a person who experienced uh, some issues when they filed a formal report. This is from a long testimony from a person who we did a follow-up interview 
we asked why the formal report didn't work. And this person said, I reported the serial sexual harasser. He suffered no consequences after reporting. My identity was not protected. And other older male colleagues heard that I was being aggressive for reporting and not accepting that there were zero consequences. I wish the outcome would have been better for me and things would have changed. So ironically, she followed the rules and then ended up leaving. And the harasser or person who did the harassment had no consequences at all. And we see that this is the case. So if a formal report doesn't work, what will work and what can we do about it? So what can we do is we can intervene. I have two quotes above from our survey. The first one says, I wish someone would have intervened and explained to the person behaving that way that their behavior was derogatory in manner was unjust. And the other one says, just someone saying something to support intervening. I know I can't, oh, it always can't be prevented, but at least someone could say something. For all of the harassment and bias that people are experiencing, we see that they often wish a senior person, professor, or someone with more power would have stepped in and said something by calling out the behavior and problematizing it, explaining the clear message that this is not acceptable and that we will not tolerate it any further. This bar graph represents whether there was a bystander intervention in the event if a bystander saw it and intervened. We have 512 in the middle bar showing the total where no one did anything. 27% say, I'm not sure if something happened because maybe it was after the incident, but I actually don't know. And that meant that only 16% of those remainders did something on the spot. So the bystander did do something, but it was a very small percent compared to how many of those people wish someone had stood up and said something. That means that intervention is a great idea. People can affect the situation. They can help uh, a positive impact for the scholars. So the results that we have seen in the survey, we're proposing that we change the incentives for bystanders with a few evidence-based solutions. NSF and NASIM have both provided some information for us. Make harassment punishable, or you can penalize them by labeling them as a person who has offended or take away any grant money that they have may, may have received. If as the NSF has stated in their statement last September, they said that explicitly that they will not tolerate sexual harassment or other forms of harassment or sexual assault within the agency, the awardee organizations, field sites, or anywhere that the research takes place on the research dime. We have a link about their statement below if you want to follow up. The second is positive awards and reinforcement for people who intervene and people to who adhere to the policies. So if a bystander intervenes, perhaps whereas now or before they were concerned about repercussions or speaking up, now they can actually do so and be rewarded for it. The third is a person who shows that kind of action can be rewarded. So this is a good initiative. And is this only for people in power? We think not necessarily. And that leads us to ask, okay, so who is this we that we've been speaking of? We realize that we have a lot of different we's in the room. We have faculty, we have students, undergrad, graduate, postdocs, et cetera. And so we need to change the culture and explain who we're talking about. 
instructors, we should ask, who's on your syllabus? If you have a syllabus and it is read by a scholar and they have a reputation for some type of harassment and you have to reference or talk about their work and discuss it, it might be a good idea to give a little bit about the reputation of their behavior. And while the work might be great, the behavior is inexcusable, and it's important to let people know that this is not acceptable. So what's on the syllabus? If you can put a policy about harassment, don't put the institutional boilerplate um, policy about something that you just got from some institutional website. Put something that makes sense to you and tells students that you're serious about this issue and you will take action if something occurs. As it goes to students, remember, students who have taken the survey feel that they are powerless and that they can't do anything about it. But we want to tell you that students have more power than you realize. One example of action that you could take is to set up, set up a union at the university or to participate in a union if one is already there and recognize that all, not all universities have unions, but that it doesn't mean you can't take other types of action. For example, if you join a union, you can work together to include language about bias and harassment in the contract. And for whatever reason, you can if you need, you can support each other, you can join an affinity group, you can work together, and you can look for faculty to support those groups. If you don't have a group, you can set one up. So more we's. We have asked you and those who are less marginalized and less privileged are those who are more privileged to please get involved. If you see an incident happening and it continues to happen, Try to think about predicting and have a plan ahead what to say or what to do so that you don't have to think on the spot. That way you can be able to be better prepared to intervene. In addition, if you have a place where you can invite more marginalized people, make sure that place is space, uh, safe. And if people who have experienced that are welcome, and that you can believe that things will not be affected in that safe space. Next. Another quote from the survey. Gravitas comes with responsibility. And if enough effort, if enough make the effort, our culture can change. And that change can ripple throughout academia. I would like to make a closing statement. We would like to reinstate, or reiterate rather, the point that we are all affected by harassment and complicit in what has been happening. At the same time, we are all affected. Who is complicit and who has the power is not uniform in the room or in our field. In order to change the current climate, we have to take action as individuals and as communities of practice. That requires us to recognize and that we live in a larger culture that normalizes harassment and much of the normalization occurs through behavior in our everyday lives. We have to come to understand the harassment as natural and often unproblematic to the point where we have internalized it. The consequence is that we are complicit to it. At the same time, many of us who have experienced or have witnessed harassment are left to deal with the trauma on our own at a huge personal and professional cost. We have to work towards denormalizing harassment for starters. That would involve steps like naming the abusers, holding them accountable for their actions, opening up dialogue about what happened and that it's not okay and that it hurts everyone, identifying the harassment, problematizing it, and that we have to take a more critical approach to creating and fostering a more inclusive space for everyone. So we invite everyone 
to the party as we make plans for what to do next. Now it's your turn. So um, if you have anything um, written on your card, um, we can pass them maybe to the the ends and we can um, pick them up. Um, and um, just in closing, I want to say, um, point you to our website, which has right now this really long URL, but hopefully we'll have a shorter one soon. Um, and we have posted um, a lot of different testimonials. And so you can see, I mean, I think it's really important to read these things so you can see like the range of, of pain and suffering that people are going through that are our colleagues and students and friends. Um, and so there you also find there's a, a document um, called Actions People Can Take that has um, even more types of things that people can do. You can submit your story or, and give feedback to us. Um, and again, that's like that hashtag linguist survey. Um, so we can get started with like questions, comments, and hopefully suggestions for um, how we can make a better life. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks. Right? This is on. So I'm just checking. So when I was 24 and I was handing in my master's thesis to my thesis advisor, him putting his tongue down my throat was not part of it. Right? Uh, this was 1975. So it was a long time ago. I've been doing this for 46 years. I'm currently emeritus, retired. In my experience, the metaphor for university administrations is circle the wagons, which is a good old American, Western American metaphor. What works in my experience and what I didn't see mentioned here and which should be considered is hire a lawyer and give financial consequences for what's going on. That's mm -hmm. what works. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your story. That's terrible. Yeah, absolutely. Like administration, I mean, that's the other reason why I think it's on us because universities just want to protect universities. They don't care about us. <laughs> and not only that, Title IX is under attack right now. The, like suing universities is not super going to work probably either. That hasn't really been successful. So we need to be the ones to make the change because no one's going to do it for us. So anyway, thank you. Other comments we had some, is there anything you want to? Okay. <laughs> this is a really good question. So how can I as a white male serve as an ally and help fight the problems in parentheses without being creepy? Which, that's, yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody want, I mean, we can also just make this sort of a discussion, so if anyone wants to speak up about that, that's really welcome as well, or I can also give my thoughts. Yes, please. Hi, thank you. I'm not sure this addresses exactly that question, mm -hmm. but um, just this is for professors. So I have had a lot of PhD students, and many of them have been fortunate to go into into place, you know, tenure track positions, and to the person, every single one of them has experienced bias and harassment. But this doesn't immediately come out because people don't want to disappoint me. So I feel like it's incumbent upon us to ask and make sure people feel comfortable telling us. So I had one student who was placed at a Midwestern university and was continually um, harassed over his sexual orientation. And this became such a problem. And finally, the only thing that wound up working out was um, was the legal route. Um, and he just, you know, took them to court and this actually worked out. But of course, this didn't help his academic career. It just resolved that situation, right? So now, like, it's kind of back to square one and with all this baggage, but but anyway, please hear people out, like invite your students to tell you these things when they happen and be ready to intervene if necessary. Yeah, so thank you so much for making that point. One thing that um, uh, some people suggested, and it's also in our actions people can take, is during advising meetings and things like that, actively asking 
um, instead of waiting for students to come to you, like how things are going and asking about things like harassment, just keeping an eye on it and being proactive as um, mentors, that's a really good way of, and apparently like doctors have started doing that for mental health issues and it's gotten more people to seek mental health care, for example. So this is like coming from that model. Um, so that's another important point to make. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just on to the question of what, uh, you know, cis white males can do. Um, at our institution, various student groups have organized ally training workshops for various kinds of, uh, of uh, issues. So, you know, LGBTQ, women's issues, um, disability, vets, non uh, uh, first generation students. There's ally training you can take. And we've instituted a policy in our department of putting the names of people who have undergone ally training on our website under our That's diversity thing. So people within our community know who's supposed to have the resources to help. That's a Thanks. great idea. Thank you. Yeah, I think ally training and there's also bystander intervention training. Um, a lot of universities do have uh, resources like that that can be helpful. Yeah. Thanks. So on the same note, um, I was just going to say on the what do you do as a white male, uh, the intervention part is really, really important. And I think a lot of times people don't intervene for reasons that don't have to do with them not thinking that they should, uh, but have to do with them thinking that if they should, they will be taking focus away from, you know, um, the person who's being victimized or um, that they will or, or that the person is handling it right and i think a lot of times especially if like if it seems like women are handling it like men are like i don't want to you know like i don't want to disrupt that because you guys got this like you don't need me right um and we might not need you uh <laughs> but it, it might still feel good um to have backup and, and and a lot of times it is a situation where it's clear that a person will be more likely to be either swayed or shut down by someone who is not not a white male, right? So, um, uh, or, or who is a, uh, yeah, exactly, my double negative. I think it worked. Uh, anyway, so I would just say, like, intervene, but also, like, be humble about it. Like, don't, it's, you're not going to get cookies. It's not about medals. Uh, don't make it about you. And give a disclaimer if you feel like you have to. Like, hey, I don't, you know, it seems like you guys are handling this, but, you know, just so you know, knock it off or, you know, I, or I agree or something like that. Right. Because it does feel really terrible when you're in this situation, trying to make the case that someone is doing something that is offensive or hurtful and no one else, it seems like no one else sees it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so acknowledging mm -hmm. that other people who aren't in your same position see it mm -hmm. is I think a really important and valuable move. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. And I, I, completely agree because part of the problem is sort of normalization, um, right? And it's like a lot of students actually said, or a lot of respondents said, I was being harassed, but I didn't realize it was a harassment until years later. That was a pretty common response that we got. And so that's another thing. Having somebody see you and point out that it's wrong can make such a huge difference. Um, so, and also if, especially if you have sort of a position over, of power over, um, anybody there, it shows, look, we don't stand for this. This is part of that cultural change. This is not okay in this culture right now. And so that's how you change cultural norms. That's one of the ways. So thank you. Yeah. Sophie. Yeah. I just actually have a similar comment. I want to piggyback on the previous comment. I actually do have some mixed feelings about the rewarding of, for people who intervene, because I think that should be a normal expected behavior. We shouldn't necessarily have to single out anyone or reward them for this kind of behavior. So I do have mixed feelings about that suggestion. I'm open to different perspectives and to hear them. But I think we want to foster more of a culture of this kind of behavior to intervene as being normalized instead of something that someone will receive special kudos for. Yeah, I think that's a good point. <laughs> I think um, so the types of things that other professional societies have done have been people who are have done like undertaken, you know, big efforts or really, you know, or at least like so, for example, folks that have 
come together and called out accusers and, you know, have gone through a lot of like, so the, like, for example, people who have had to sue and they have had a huge professional cost, having some type of something to mitigate that um, would be good. I don't know exactly what that would look like, but that could be something, some type of incentive. Yeah. Anyway, but thank you for that. Are there any more that? Do you want to do the card or do you want this? Okay. Um, I want to bring up a potential problematic case, which is that, so we had a um, training in our department um, brought in by the Office of uh, Diversity and Equity, and um, they mentioned the reporting obligations of faculty and other um, members of the department. And this actually caused a lot of students to be very concerned because they were now worried that if they wanted to talk to one of the faculty members about their problem, but they wanted not to be reported, they lost their ally. They were afraid. Now, the, the rules were, I think, I interpreted them as being much more subtle than that, actually, and in terms of who has reporting obligations and for what kind of issues. Um, but just the, knowing that people, some people have a reporting obligation for some issues causes a, a lot of problems for people, and I think it's really helpful if people know what these constraints are. That's a great point. And people have found that if you have mandatory reporting, um, reporting itself goes down. It's just a really bad policy to have um, in lots of cases. And also, like you say, it's complicated because you, a lot of times the, the sort of most normal type of harassment that happens is like hard to name and it's hard to figure out what it is. And you might not know if it really like reaches the level of I have to report or I need to take this up to these different steps. I mean, there's some cases that are really clear cut majority are not. And so that makes it a lot harder to even bring it up. So I think just talking about those sort of, you know, quote, smaller, more everyday, like less actionable legally cases and making that more normal is also a big part of changing the culture about talking about these things. Yeah. Just from an institutional perspective, anyone who's a TA or a professor is at some level, a mandated reporter for some types of crimes, right? Like if you see child abuse, you must report it. But if you don't want, if you want to maintain confidentiality, every university has a, an ombuds person office. So the ombuds office is going to be the place where you can figure out who is in the system that can maintain confidentiality for your case. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is a follow on. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, let's do, sorry, let's do okay. a couple. Oh, is it a follow-up? Well, it's a follow-up for the previous two before that one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we could, what? Okay, let's do these first. Sorry, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so these two kind of go together. So one is, um, uh, in brackets, uh, possibly rhetorical, why aren't there more senior scholars in this room right now? And the other is, how are we reaching the people who aren't here? And so I'm going to, pause on the first one for how we're reaching the people who aren't here. One of my hopes is that, you know, you will go and then they tell two people and then they tell two people and that will be a type of thing that hopefully can happen. Um, but yes, I would like to, that is something that I think would be a good conversation to have. Thank you. If anyone has anything to say about that, they can, but I think we can also go to this next question. Yeah. Okay, so on the issue of those um, behaviors that are hard to name and on the issue of what men and people who aren't the one being harassed at the moment can do, um, the National Academy's report that came out recently has a wealth of data, much of it peer-reviewed, real solid data that can convince any scientist, forget the people who think it's not a problem, this is convincing stuff. Um, and basically their definition of this problem is that sexual harassment is the most egregious but least common. Then there's unwanted sexual behaviors. And then there is gender harassment. Now, that is everywhere. It's hard to name. It's subtle. If you look at the literature on um, microaggressions, there's not even a really good agreement on what these are because they can be different to different people in different contexts coming from different sources. So it's a, a really ripe area for social science to get onto. But on the other hand, you know, basically, if you look at what is the most common, it is gender harassment. And anyone who's an onlooker can effectively deal with that. 30 years ago, the only other woman working with me at Hewlett Packard and I used to support each other by saying, 
you know, I would say, as Lynn said half an hour ago, and you just repeated, it's really not his idea. As Lynn said half an hour ago, X, and she did the same to me. This is when I first noticed this. So when I was the fir first a reviewer on an NSF panel as an assistant professor 25 years ago, I was my, it was my very first panel. I was the only woman in the room, the only social scientist. It was all computer scientists and engineers. Um, I had to go first with the very first review. So I said rather tentatively, well, this is not my area of expertise, but I'll do my best. I did my best. The second person, the late Randy Pausch, got up and said, this is my area of expertise, and I couldn't have done better. And so that's the kind of support you can do before anything even escalates. You know, we know that we sell handicap if we're in a situation of uncertainty. There's a wealth of things that people who are paying attention to not these extreme, dramatic, oh, my God, jaw-dropping situations that you're not going to see that often, hopefully less now. But the gender harassment thing is everywhere. It's constant, and you can intervene without calling any kind of showdown some of the time. So I encourage that. Thank you. Yeah, that is, so we have like a little, um, uh, you should really check out the National Academies of Sciences report if you haven't. Um, they have a lot of evidence-based solutions um, and also a lot of good like sort of infographics and things um, if you're looking to communicate with your departments or your communities about these issues, for sure. Um, I think you can read each question there. Oh, good. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I'll respond to some of those. All right. So are there resources for professional intervention strategies specifically for junior scholars to employ? Yes, we are putting more resources on our website. We're listing out different suggestions as well. So you can check that out for more information. And then also the National Academies report has resources. So I don't know if they have for specifically for junior scholars. Yeah, the, the NASM. Okay, so the next one is um, in with regards to discussion about penalties for harassment. If the offender is a senior per, in a senior position, how can this happen in ways that avoid collateral damage? For example, would taking away grant funding affect their grad students who might be the victims of otherwise marginalized or otherwise marginalized? And this is a huge problem. So we know that there's, oh, sorry, there's ripple effects. Oh, that's but, fine. You, you can continue your response. Oh, no, I mean, that's like really, I, I think, Lena, you should definitely respond. But I think that this is a huge question and something that we definitely should talk about because there are huge, it's not just that one person, the whole department gets affected and the whole community gets affected, as we all know. And people have to do more work because of it, yeah. Next one. More cards? Um, what are the ways in which um, white cis male senior scholars are planning to address the toxicity of the field? Where are the venues that mandatorily inform them on the experiences of the minoritized? I think there are many ways to address those issues. First, I think you can really listen to people when they share their stories and really think about how easy it is for them to overlook. Sorry, I'm, um, it's really easy to overlook those kind of incidents. I think really listening to people and becoming, becoming more conscious. And someone who's not a cis white male, I have to say, I don't know how necessarily easy it would be for me to overlook because I notice these things quite a bit. But really listening to people's stories. I think that based on my experience, People who are more willing to listen have more potential for allyship. And secondly, I think that really you need to use your position, your platform to speak up and hold space for people who are coming to you. I don't necessarily think that is you need to do so much overt intervention, but really holding space for people to speak their truth. I think that has a lot of um, impact. Communication with people who are the most affected those are really important actions that you can take. I think oftentimes we see people who have good intentions to be helpful, but they end up being more harmful as a result and can um, really have chaos, make the situation even worse. Yeah, I, and this sort of mandatoriness and who's in this room and who isn't is a huge, huge issue for that. So I don't know. Um, so we only have two more minutes. Um, so I think we'll just take one final question and then um, we can wrap up. And also, by the way, like if you go to the website, you can 
submit questions or comments or anything there as well. So like we can keep this conversation going and hopefully at future LSA meetings and future all professional organization meetings to come. So thanks. I noticed on your website that you include as a question on the survey um, whether you've ever been told that you are not a linguist or that your research is not linguistics. And I'm glad that you named that as being a form of bias. Um, I wonder if you could talk about how the response to that question broke down in terms of gender or race and so on. Yeah, that was super complicated. There's like a lot of analyses we've done for that. So, um, yeah, it is. So there's different ways because we look, we asked so many, so many questions. And so the ways that I've looked at it so far, and I'm like really open to people, um, who are interested in this issue. It's like sort of, like you say, irrelevant, but like, you know, sort of slightly tan, like, you know, here issue. Um, is that, I mean, I don't think it, you're right. It is the same thing, but like, and it also does intersect because, okay, here's an example. So people talk about for people who are, if, if you're sort of <laughs> people who are, um, more minoritized basically are more likely to be told that they are not a linguist and they're also more likely to be doing the types of, um, in the types of subfields that are not considered to be real linguistics. And also, if you look, we have a section of the testimonials of people talking about climate within different subfields. That's a huge analysis we've done. A lot of people say, I've been driven out of philosophy of language. I've been driven out of semantics. I don't want to go to syntax conferences or workshops anymore because of the bias and harassment that I've seen. So it is actually a really central issue. And there's, yeah, anyway, it's... It's, there's a lot to say about that, basically, um, but it sort of breaks down in the way that you would expect. And there is there is evidence that we see people being pushed away from what is, quote, core linguistics. And then as a result, like how we define linguistics becomes what the people who are less minoritized are doing. Okay. So let's leave. Let's end on that note. Now, I'd love to talk about that more with anybody if they want to. Maybe Karina has more to say about that. I just, I just want to add to, I think what's really important about that question is it also impacts then who's in linguistics departments. And so often when we look at who's in linguistics departments, they tend to be very white. And, um, when we look at people that are considered not linguists, they end up in other departments such as, um, cultural studies or, you know, African studies or deaf studies or something like this where it's like, well, you're not really doing the real work. So you can be in those other areas and, Maybe that's not where those people want to be. They want to be linguists, right? Or like if you happen to be somebody who speaks Spanish as a first language, then you're expected that you should end up in a Spanish linguistics department. And that's just ridiculous. So I think we need to be thinking about, you know, when we're saying who is and who isn't a linguist, what the repercussions are for then who's in the field and who's in our departments and who's training our students and who are the advisors and so on and so forth. So um, I just want to end by saying that, um, they have just informed me that all of the slides and the NASM report are all going to be accessible shortly after this talk on the LSA website, as well as a link to our website. So you guys can check out all of the rest of the cool data and kind of play around with it and see about the things that we didn't have to report today. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it.